thank you all for being here. My computer's been a little buggy, so I think I heard Aaron say start. Um, hopefully that's what he said. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today and this week. We've been busy uh, trying to get executive noms through our committee process. Hopefully some of you have been able to log on and see that process where we've been using virtual technology in the committee room to be able to consider the governor's nominations for different uh, committees, boards, uh, commissions, and uh, executive agencies. Uh, that's gone fairly smooth. We've had a few glitches, but worked through those and had really good questions on some nominees yesterday. We had Kevin Corbett with the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority and had really good questions and debate on that. Hopefully many of you saw that. Obviously the compacts issue uh, is one that you've all, you all have seen. Uh, the speaker and I put out a, a joint letter to the governor requesting some more information and telling him that we did not think those compacts were valid. Uh, although I share the governor's desire to get a better deal for the state of Oklahoma, I think this is neither a better, better deal nor uh, legal. And so I have some real concerns about the two compacts that were announced earlier this week. Uh, still reading through those. Um, I got those at the same time the public got them to review. Uh, I know there's several questions about when are we going to open the Capitol back up. Uh, most of the space in the Capitol is uh, controlled by both the speaker and myself for the House and the Senate. And so we'll consult with health experts. We, we have an obligation to our employees and to the public to make sure that we make the best decision for public health. And we will be consulting with each other and with health experts as we go forward uh, in that arena. Uh, and so I just want to see if you have any questions and just uh, stay in touch. Okay, so if anyone has a question, now would be the time to uh, let me know in the chat and we'll recognize you. Uh, looks like Barbara is uh, first up. So Barbara, you're on, go ahead. Um, hi, Pro Tim. My question is, um, can you talk about the, the budget figures that were released earlier this week for 2021 and um, if you think they're valid? Yeah, thank you for that question, Barbara. Uh, the BOE meeting, uh, first off, we appreciate them calling it and having uh, the revenue failure declared, which uh, was obvious and we all knew about. The point that uh, was a little concerning was point five on the agenda that you're referring to that dealt with some new estimates about fiscal year 21, which we're negotiating, uh, obviously, before signing that, we'll have a balanced budget for those. We had been going into this budget negotiation knowing uh, that our revenue picture was looking worse than what they had told us in February. Uh, they presented, uh, without any backup data, about a $1.3 billion shortfall off of what they had given us an estimate in February. I'm still circumspect about those numbers. Uh, I have Senator Thompson as my appropriations chair trying to dig in those, uh, there was no data given to us prior to the meeting to verify or to back up uh, the estimate from the Oklahoma Tax Commission. Uh, we all know and we want to be prudent uh, with taxpayer dollars and we also want to make sure that we are completely cognizant that we're going to have less than they certified in February, but I think that number uh, potentially is exaggerated. Okay, looks, Carmen, you're up next. Go ahead. Hey, Pro Tem. Um, clearly, I didn't get the message we were doing coat and tie today. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I have a couple questions, if that's okay. And um, the first one kind of goes off the budget. Um, where are we at on funding Medicaid expansion, <clears throat> considering that's supposed to maybe happen in a couple months? Yeah, thank you for that. And the coat and tie uh, was because I knew I'd be with esteemed people on this call. And also I had exec nom on uh, business and commerce right before this. So, uh, but the, the Medicaid monies, there still is not an agreement on Sooner Care 2.0 and or funding. One of the questions that I asked of Kevin Corbett as he was before the Health and Human Services Committee yesterday was how do you balance with the traditional Medicaid population, the governor's proposed Sooner Care 2.0, and then state potentially state question 802. We're moving on three tracks, it seems to me. Uh, and the numbers have gone up uh, largely because more people have um, 
now qualify for Medicaid because of our current economic conditions. Uh, there's also some offset because the federal government has given an additional 6.2% FMAP uh, on some of those Medicaid patients, but with uh, the, the caveat that you cannot kick any ineligible participants out. So as far as Sooner Care 2.0, the roughly $200 million, 150 for the expansion, plus about a 50 million for those newly qualified, I think is what uh, Kevin Corbett said yesterday. There's no agreement to that end yet. I know the governor is still pursuing uh, the state plan amendment uh, with the federal administration, but we have not committed to, to getting the money there yet. Okay, and then um, second question, if it's okay, Aaron. Um, uh, I'm kind of curious, you know, the governor was asked earlier this week about the notary requirement for absentee ballots. And he, he kind of said, you know, I'd have to feel out the legislature, see if there's an appetite for that. So I'm curious if there is an appetite for maybe changing that requirement for the June 30th primary um, in the Senate. Is there any appetite? Yeah, so Carmen, who did you say was asked that? Oh, uh, the governor. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't see that. I'm, I'm sorry. And my computer cut out again, but the, uh, there's been conversations. Uh, obviously there's some people who just want to take away uh, any validation that the person uh, is who they say they are. I think we need to make sure we protect the integrity of the ballot. But those discussions are ongoing. Uh, there's potential that you could have other ways of verifying other than a notary uh, public, and we are having those conversations. All right, we're going to go to Dylan Richards next. Uh, oh, go ahead, Dylan. Um, hey, Senator, I thought I turned my video on so Carmen doesn't feel like the only one who didn't get the memo, but we're all. We're all casual. <laughs> um, my question was on tribal gaming, kind of a two-pronged question. The first being, and maybe, you know, maybe you're not ready to answer this yet, but the first being, if those two compacts are submitted to the Department of the Interior, do you guys see any kind of legal action going into that? Or what are those discussions like right now? And then the Comanche Nation and the Oto Missouri tribe put out a statement last night where they said they feel like those compacts are lawful because they just anticipate um, the possibility of sports betting going into effect. And I, I just didn't know if you had seen that and, and what your thoughts were on that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dylan. I, I did see those comments. Uh, the Department of Interior, obviously the federal government has their own prerogative to make a decision. I think that these potentially would be jeopardized when they get before the Department of Interior for consideration of approval uh, because of the expansion of land into non-historic uh, uh, reservation land from these tribes. They're actually getting land in areas outside of their historic reservation status. And in fact, some land within tribal boundaries of other existing tribes. And so I think there'll be some real fight at the federal level on that. I also think the federal government will look at, is this an authentic agreement? Was the governor authorized by state statute or state constitution to enter into these agreements? And that's where I think it will get tripped up. I'm no expert on the Department of Interior, but I do know there are state statutes and state constitution, but particularly when it comes to compacting, that's found in our state statutes. And it really sets the bar ditches. It says, yes, it, it recognizes the governor has the right to negotiate uh, with independent um, sovereigns uh, and the tribes, but it sets bar ditches and says, as long as you stay within these parameters uh, of authorized gaming, uh, you can negotiate. Uh, what, this, what these compacts uh, purport to be able to do is change state statute uh, through an agreement with the governor and tribes. And I, I think that's clearly outside the scope of the law. As far as the statements from the two tribes, I, I saw those statements. Um, I uh, respect that they disagree, but, but I think the law is clearly on the side of the letter that the speaker and I sent, and also uh, the attorney general of the state of Oklahoma uh, shares the same opinion, or, or, or rather I should say I share the opinion of the attorney general. Uh, in this case. Okay, Sean Ashley had a question, but he said uh, you just, you've answered it already pro tem. So now we're gonna go to Rick from Fox 23. 
Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, that letter that was sent out, that was some, that was some tough wording. And I was wondering if the way that everything went, has that strained the relationship between y'all and the governor at all? Um, I, I, it was, it was pretty harsh in some terms. Uh, thank you for the question, Rick. I, I think when you look at separation of powers and constitutional authority, we take that seriously. And whenever that is infringed upon and directly infringed upon, uh, we have to take that serious and we have to push it back. Uh, no state is served well by one person being able to, to unilaterally change state law or state constitution. Our founders didn't envision it that way on the federal side and our founders here in the state definitely did not. So we take it serious. Nothing personal with the governor. Uh, the governor's got a job to do. We just believe that uh, his actions stepped outside of the scope that is allowed by the law. I have a budget question as well. Um, is the rainy day fund equipped to kind of enough with what we are applying this year versus uh, next fiscal year? Is there enough in the rainy day fund to kind of cushion the fall, so to speak? Or are we, or what kind of cuts are you looking at? Well, because of, of good fiscal management the previous couple of years, we did have around a billion dollars in savings uh, in existence. And then we also have revenue still coming in. So we, we're in a much better fiscal position than uh, years that I've seen downturns uh, in my service. I got elected in 2011 and the majority of my time we've, we've had to make cuts uh, to state budgets because we've come in low. I think we're around $470 million off for next year, uh, rather than the 1.3 billion the Board of Equalization talked about. Still trying to verify those numbers. Uh, and we also have to make sure we take into account, and one of the things we have to, to make sure there's transparency around is, or the federal dollars that'll be flowing in through the governor's office to state agencies. That's one of the things that hasn't really been considered in all these budget discussions yet. Of where do those monies go and how does that offset any uh, loss of revenue? And, and I'm very interested to get to the bottom of that. All right, we're going back to Barbara. Um, go ahead, Barbara. I, the question I had is when the governor set state question on the 802 on the June 30th ballot. Is it your opinion that that, that 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 helps or hurts Republicans or does it really matter one way or the other? You know, I don't think it should be a consideration of partisan impact, either Republican or Democrat. I think it should be about the merits of the question. And I haven't really engaged in, in thought or discussion about uh, the, that date being preferable or not preferable. Um, but it's, that's definitely within the governor's prerogative to set that date. And we all know now the proponents and the opponents. Okay. Up next will be Ray Carter. Uh, yeah, Senator, uh, the, the letter saying it last night, I mean, from the beginning of this, this discussion on the gaming compacts, I mean, it's been openly acknowledged that sports betting was part of the negotiations. The letter last night sounded like we're shocked that gambling's going on in Casablanca. What, why would the legislature not sign off on that quickly? Uh, because it was, everyone was planning to anyways, and you're going to get more money out of the deal during a downturn. Uh, thank you for the question, Ray. I think your, your premise of your question is, is mistaken. We're not getting more money. In fact, the percentages, is, uh, the tribes that we were pulled into a meeting last minute right before the press conference said that they were actually getting a better deal and a lower percentage. Obviously, if they get to expand in other tribes' territories, I guess you could make an argument that there could be some more money flowing in. The sports betting, uh, as you all know and Ray, you would know, uh, I killed that uh, two or three years ago uh, when it came out of the House. It came over to the Senate, and I was very clear and, and very clear with the tribes and very clear publicly that I thought that would be part of the negotiations. What I didn't envision was that you would separate off uh, two tribes and make an agreement and, and not make an agreement across the board to try to get a, the state in a better position. I, I don't think 
the compacts as I've read them again, I had no part uh, in the negotiation and was handed them. At, I actually read them on the Tulsa world website because the, they told me they would not give them to me in our meeting. Um, I um, I don't find them to be more advantageous for the state of Oklahoma. All right, up next is Andrea from Nondoc filling in today for uh, Trey Savage. Go ahead, uh, Andrea, with your question. Uh, yeah, hi. So the question we had was that in the way the governor described the rollout of the phases for opening up the economy in the next several weeks, um, it sounds like places like restaurants and theaters and churches are going to be open before the Capitol is open to the public. Um, and I'm just wondering if that's right and if you could comment on that. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I hope you heard my opening comments that the majority of the capital space is controlled by the speaker and myself as far as uh, the vast majority of the space in the capital. And so I'll be having conversations with the speaker about uh, how to do this safely. Uh, I haven't had a chance to review the governor's plans on reopening uh, the state. I know he had the press conference yesterday, but I, I I got the documents when everyone else did, and, and I'm trying to review those myself. I've got an obligation as an employer as well. Uh, obviously, uh, there's duly elected members, my colleagues in the Senate, but we also have a ton of nonpartisan staff and EAs, uh, and I have a duty uh, uh, as their employer to make sure that their their health is protected as well, and I take that seriously. So we'll be consulting with health experts as we make those determinations. Okay, up next is Steve Metzer. Go ahead, Steve. Good morning. Appreciate your having us. Uh, and I apologize. I, I joined just a little bit late, so you may have addressed some of this already. And if you have, I apologize for that as well. But um, uh, I wondered if you felt like that the um, projection of revenue shortfalls going into the next fiscal year uh, that were uh, released the other day, if they're still too fluid to really uh, count on, if you think there might be uh, some possibility that they'll, they'll be either more or less than the, pr the projections that were made. And uh, I don't know if you can give any uh, idea about uh, the Senate priorities for, uh, for protecting things like education spending or, or uh, other agency spending going into the next fiscal year, considering the the budget uh, revenue shortfalls. And then finally, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk at the federal level about uh, relief packages and whether money should be uh, made available to cities and states to uh, fill in budget problems. Uh, specifically, I think some of the criticism has been about uh, shoring up pension funds in places like Illinois and Lots of lawmakers don't favor that. So I'd kind of like to get some thoughts on whether you feel like the, some of that federal relief money should be made available to cities and states. All right, Stephen, you, you, uh, you made me take notes here uh, uh, with the length of your question. I appreciate it. And let me tell you, I'll try to handle them. If I miss something, uh, please speak up. But on the budget projections, I did address that earlier, but I'll reiterate. Um, that I'm circumspect about the numbers right now, uh, still trying to get the backup data. I've assigned my appropriations chair, Roger Thompson, to dig into that. Uh, the Board of Equalization uh, voted on the letter on, on agenda item number five without really seeing, as, as far as I know, without really seeing a lot of backup data to prove the $1.3 billion shortfall. We all know there's been an adverse economic impact with COVID-19 and also with the depressed oil and gas numbers. Uh, and so that is no surprise. The magnitude of the 1.3 was a surprise because that came out of uh, left field. Uh, we had not seen any of that prior to that meeting. Uh, and we're wanting to get uh, backup data. We're asking important questions to get to the root of it because they have real impact on state agencies, including education, including healthcare, including law enforcement. And so we take that very seriously. We were able to hold FY20 uh, harmless as far as the cuts. It would have been a, a much greater magnitude to have those cuts in the last two months of the fiscal year. You would have had to multiply any cut by six to get to the percentage cut. Uh, 
uh, on those, and that would have been very uh, devastating uh, to the core function of government. As far as the set priorities, uh, yes, we obviously prioritize public education, but there are many other uh, core functions as well, education being first and foremost. But in the middle of a pandemic, we, we need to make sure healthcare is taken care of. Uh, we need to make sure people are getting the vital services they need uh, around the state. And a uh, little surprise, I mean, basically the, the Board of Equalization's letter to the legislature uh, was tantamount to calling for a 7.5% across the board cut. Uh, and, and that simply, uh, the Senate doesn't stand for that. We need, if we make cuts, they need to be targeted and they need to be methodical and with data backing it up to make sure that we don't inhibit the core function uh, of government. Education uh, simply cannot afford a 7.5% cut uh, as it was anticipated in the, the 0.5 of the Board of Equalization packet. And then the relief for states uh, question, Stephen, I, I, I've seen that's, um, gotten a lot of drama and I saw the Senate leader uh, on the U.S. Senate side has taken some heat for some comments he's made on that. I do think we need to make sure, uh, you know, I, I, before I became a state senator, I'd worked for Tom Coburn in the U.S. Senate. And, and we need to make sure that states are responsible for themselves uh, when it comes to pensions and that, those type of things. But obviously the relief package that came down through the care package, um, with the over $1 billion to the state of Oklahoma is welcome. What we need on that uh, from a state legislature's perspective, state legislators perspective is transparency. We need to make sure the public knows uh, where those monies are going and how they're being utilized. And as a legislator, it would be very helpful to know how they're being utilized to make the budget decisions as we're crafting next year's budget. Okay, it looks like we've got time um, for one more question and Barbara was up in the queue. So go ahead, Barbara, with the last question. Uh, actually, I have a two for, I hope that's okay. Um, Governor Stitt has repeatedly said that the 40 million bucks in federal stimulus money for education is gonna go to uh, the Equal Opportunity Scholarship Fund and AP access in rural areas. Uh, one, what are your thoughts on that? And then my follow-up question would be, in light of the situation with cities and uh, counties, is there any support to let uh, property taxes help assist uh, fund cities and counties? All right, thanks, Barbara. We told you you only had time for one, so I only can answer one. No, I, I'm playing. I'll, I'll answer them both. The uh, uh, the first question on the Equal Opportunity Scholarship Fund and the governor's utilization of the federal monies. Uh, again, that's one of those that I have trouble commenting on because I haven't seen the transparent uh, methodology for how those determinations are made. I know there's some money that's gonna direct, flow directly into the State Department of Education and I don't know how much that is or, or the extent of that. So that's a hard decision for me to, to on the fly tell you. I'm a very methodical person. I want to see the whole game plan before I, I make a comment. In the past, I've obviously been supportive of people being able to have options, and I want to make sure that kids uh, in impoverished areas get as good an opportunity as my kids in Deer Creek School District. Uh, and so my heart is for kids being able to get an equal opportunity, but I don't know what went into the determination. Uh, I learned about the governor's desired use of the 40 million uh, as you did at the press conference. And so I haven't seen any uh, information on the extent of how much is going to public education versus the Equal Opportunity Scholarship Fund. So I've still got a lot of unanswered questions there looking at it uh, as, as, as you are. And then the second question on property taxes, um, I've been a long proponent of being able to have more flexible use of property taxes for school districts and for municipalities. However, uh, I believe that I'm in the minority on that opinion at the state capitol. And so I don't think that that is a, a real possibility um, before signing die this year to give more flexibility on property tax dollars. Although I uh, personally uh, believe in local decisions and 
be able to give uh, cities and counties and school districts a little bit more flexibility in that arena. I don't hold that much hope that that will advance or, or carry much favor uh, or, or, or gain much favor at the, at the state capitol. Hey, this is Aaron. Thanks again for everyone joining us. I'll just give another quick pitch today. There are a few more Senate committee uh, ha having meetings for executive nominations. So uh, go over to our website and you can follow along with those. Um, it, um, Pro Tim, any final thoughts before we go? No, I appreciate everyone joining. Uh, thank you so much for your interest and I will keep doing these as long as you find them helpful. So thank you so much.